Welcome to the Sad Crime Channel. Today's case took place in Defiance, Ohio, in the United States in 2003. November 3, 2003. The emergency dispatcher received a chilling call. A 10-year-old boy, who identified himself as Corey, sobbed into the phone, saying he had just shot his father. He mentioned trying to hand him the gun when it suddenly went off. The child sounded absolutely terrified, occasionally breaking into tears. The dispatcher advised the boy to attempt CPR on his father, following the instructions she provided. Corey tried to follow her directions, but he struggled. Fortunately, the police arrived quickly. They were met with a horrifying scene. On the bed in the bedroom lay 34-year-old Robert. He wasn't breathing or moving. There was an entry wound visible on his head. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that he was dead. One of the officers spoke with the 10-year-old perpetrator. Corey was shattered and terrified. He cried, insisting it was all his fault. His dad wanted to show him how to handle a gun so they could go hunting together sometime. At one point, father asked his son to hand him the shotgun. The boy went to the corner of the room, picked up the object, and accidentally put his finger on the trigger. A shot rang out. Robert fell onto the bed, blood spurting from his head. Corey couldn't control his nerves. He kept repeating that he was guilty and apologizing. Clumsily, he tried to show the police officers how he had grabbed the deadly weapon. The officers listened calmly to the child and then proceeded with examining the scene. The victim had earplugs in, which seemed strange. Hunting magazines were scattered around the bed. Suddenly, a long-haired woman entered the empty apartment. She introduced herself as Judith Hawkey, Corey's stepmother. She hugged the tearful child, reassuring him that everything would be okay. However, fear was evident in her eyes. Upon hearing that her husband was dead, she froze. Yet, she didn't show anything to not further distress the child whom she continued to embrace. Later on, Judith recounted to the police officers the events of that fateful day. Robert had come home early in the afternoon. He was tired, having just finished his night shift, so he went to bed. Judith wanted to go to a garage sale, but Corey didn't want to accompany her. So she took the other two children and went shopping. The ten-year-old was left in the care of his father, who had already finished his nap by then. Judith confirmed that Robert indeed intended to go hunting with his son and wanted to teach him how to handle a firearm. Previously, he had shown him how to shoot at cans. Thus, the version of an unfortunate accident seemed plausible. The case was closed. Corey faced no punishment. This was the case despite numerous inconsistencies between the boy's story and the facts. After examining the deceased, paramedics concluded that he must have been shot from very close range, not from the other end of the room as the child claimed. Additionally, Robert still had earplugs in his ears, indicating he was asleep when the bullet struck him. Thus, he couldn't have spoken to his son earlier, asking for the shotgun. Nine years later, the case of the tragically deceased Robert Brininger once again absorbed the local police. Nineteen-year-old Corey alarmed one of his teachers with a peculiar essay. In it, he described an event from his own life that evoked difficult emotions. The young man poured onto paper a chilling tale of violence he experienced from his stepmother. He also stated that she had ordered him to shoot his father, lying that he was terminally ill with brain cancer. The horrified teacher first showed the essay to the school principal. He then summoned the student for a conversation. He confirmed his belief in Corey's account and assured him of his willingness to help. Corey agreed to meet with the police officers who had appeared in his home nearly a decade ago and to present the true version of events from November 3, 2003. Corey Brininger didn't have a happy childhood. His parents' marriage fell apart when he was four years old. Soon after, his father moved with him to the home of his new partner, a petite blonde named Judith, the mother of little Emily. At first glance, the couple seemed made for each other. Friends thought they made a wonderful family. But with Judith's arrival, Corey's life turned into a nightmare. Robert Brininger worked night shifts at the mill. When he came home, he immediately fell asleep. During this time, the children were under the care of his new partner, and she treated her stepson worse than an animal. She punished him for the slightest, often imagined offenses, and not with shouting or a slap, but with regular beatings. She tried to choose less visible areas on his body, such as the groin.
To cover up any traces of violence, she made him wear long pants and long sleeve shirts. Several times, she forced Corey into a bathtub filled with icy water and attempted to drown him. She encouraged him to misbehave while she recorded everything on video. When she later showed the recordings to Robert, he was outraged by his son's behavior. He believed Judith. He even once said he wished the child had never been born. Corey complied with all of his stepmother's demands to avoid punishment, yet he still received beatings. Due to the injuries inflicted, he often missed school and couldn't participate in sports. He lived in constant fear. He saw that his stepmother clearly enjoyed torturing him. Inflicting suffering upon the child brought her perverse pleasure. Corey dreamed of permanently living with his grandparents. But even in this, Judith intervened, and none of those plans materialized. When Corey was ten years old, his stepmother shared a terrible secret with him. Sobbing, she confessed that her husband was terminally ill with brain cancer and would suffer a long, agonizing death. She convinced Corey that she and Robert had concluded that the he should be shot, because if he died in an accident, the family would receive a huge payout from the insurance policy. In the case of death due to cancer, the money would be lost. Judith presented the child with the following plan. Corey would ask his father to teach him how to handle a shotgun. He would have several training sessions, shooting at cans behind the house. And when the right moment came, the boy would aim at his parent and, supposedly accidentally, pull the trigger. The insurance company would deem the whole event an unfortunate accident. Robert would die a quick and painless death, and the remaining family members would collect the payout. Burdened with an overwhelming task, Corey couldn't find peace. On one hand, he didn't want to kill his father. On the other, he wanted to ease his suffering. On November 2nd, he asked Robert to teach him how to shoot at cans. He knew he should aim at his dad, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. Judith became furious beyond measure. The next day, Judith hinted to her stepson that today he should correct his mistake, and if he failed again, he would pay for it with his life. When Judith went to the garage sale, Corey scattered hunting magazines around Robert's bed and then grabbed the shotgun. He stood very close and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. Convinced the gun was malfunctioning, he breathed a sigh of relief and pulled the trigger again. This time there was a loud bang. For the next nine years, Corey lived in fear of his stepmother. Judith advised him to keep his mouth shut because she had a recording showing Corey murdering his father. The teenager didn't talk to anyone about who was truly responsible for Robert's death. He attempted suicide several times. He couldn't cope with the guilt. He still lived with his stepmother, although she continued to mistreat him. When he turned 18, he moved in with his best friend's parents. He wanted to finally forget about the haunting nightmare. One day, he received an unusual homework assignment. He had to write an essay about a difficult event he had experienced in the past, and then he felt that it was his only chance to get rid of the unbearable burden of memories. Nine years after the fateful November 3rd, 2003, the investigation was reopened. This time, Judith Hawkey became the prime suspect. It was discovered that after Robert's death, she cashed in $500,000 from his life insurance policy. Just a day after his death, she initiated the necessary procedures. But that's not all. Corey additionally testified that he saw Judith attempting to poison her current husband by putting a suspicious substance in his drink. Confronted with the allegations, Hawkey denied all charges. Nonetheless, in 2013, she was arrested on charges of murder, four counts of endangering children, and one count of insurance fraud. The trial of Judith commenced. She staunchly denied any guilt, asserting that her stepson fabricated all his statements. Corey bounced back, accusing his stepmother of everything imaginable, cruelty, abuse, inciting him to kill his father, threats. Once again, he recounted his spine-chilling tale. However, this time he faced resistance. The accused's attorney mercilessly highlighted all the inconsistencies in the boy's testimony. He proved that Corey didn't have many absences from school, which he claimed resulted from beatings. He could also engage in sports. He appeared in many family photos wearing shorts and short-sleeved shirts, yet his body bore no scars that would indicate years of brutal violence. 
The lawyer argued that the boy shot his father on his own initiative because he had recently announced his intention to send him to military school. Despite all these doubts, Judith Hawkey was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. For the offense of aggravated murder, he will be sentenced to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. Judge Joseph Schmink hands down the highest sentence possible in the case of Judith Hawkey. In 2003, Hawkey's stepson, Corey Brenninger, shot and killed his father. Then it was ruled an accident. Corey was just 10 years old. Years later, and after Hawkey collected hundreds of thousands in life insurance, Corey told a former teacher the truth. Hawkey had manipulated him to pull the trigger and then lie about what happened. Corey, now 20, addressed Hawkey in court. The pain you have put me through is something that should send you straight to hell. During sentencing, the judge took long pauses trying to find the right words. It's a unique set of facts in my experience. I, I was trying to come up with something that you could compare it to. When he did, his remarks were scathing. Evil beyond description I, I, is, is, is all I can say about it. Hawkey, who witnesses say showed no remorse for her actions, denies her guilt. He shot his father purposely and he made up this whole story. But evidence convinced the jury that she was entirely to blame. I just want you to know that you didn't break me. All the abuse and neglect, and look at where you're at. You're getting what you deserve. Corey sat down with WNWO after the sentencing to share what he was feeling. Relief. I was, I was ready to get it off my chest. I'd been having the burden for so long, I was just ready to get it out. Corey says now he can get on with his life. Stop living in the shadows. I don't have to worry about anything now. My, my biggest fear is she's gone. However, she didn't give up and appealed to a higher court. This court ruled that the accused deserved a retrial because the previous accusation was based almost exclusively on the testimony of her stepson. However, Judith didn't want to start the whole battle anew. She agreed to a settlement under the so-called Alford plea. The Alford plea is a legal term referring to a type of plea in criminal court cases. When a defendant enters an Alford plea, they maintain their innocence, but acknowledge that the prosecution has enough evidence to likely result in a conviction if the case were to go to trial. Essentially, by entering an offered plea, the defendant accepts the consequences of a guilty plea without admitting guilt. Based on the plea deal, a judge sentenced her to 10 years in prison, including the more than five she had already served. She was incarcerated in the Northeast Pre-Release Center in Ohio, and she was supposed to get out of prison in 2023. Corey Brininger never changed his version of events. To this day, he engages with the media, recounting his brutal childhood experiences. He believes his stepmother got what she deserved. And that's the end for today. Thank you for listening until the end. If you liked this video, please give it a like or subscribe to my channel. Until next time, goodbye.